Uh, good morning, everybody. Are you okay? We're in a different building this time. We're all going to be engineers as a result, sorry. Some touch of engineering. Um, thanks very much, Cormac. Um, what I'm going to do in this short session, which you'd be glad to know is short maybe for me, over the next 20 minutes or so, is just introduce uh, the kind of debate, the whole uh, range of issues, um, and provoke some thoughts for you around what we hope to achieve over the next two days. So specifically, I don't know, I, I refuse to buy Kindle books. I don't like them, even though uh, the idea of Kindle I know is very good to some people and it saves your back carrying books. But for me, I like physically holding a book. And when you read a new book, there's things in it that you realise you knew already. But hopefully there's things in a book that excites you, of new things you learn. And in your minds, I want you to try and think about this conference as about like an unread book. Because there are journeys we're going to go on, I hope, the speakers will back me up in this, come after me, that we're going to actually start looking at things a little bit differently, and I'll explain a bit more about that shortly. I'm also going to do a litmus test. Um, the only thing I was able to do in school in chemistry successfully was litmus testing. Do you remember doing that? <laughs> Changing the... Well, we're going to do a little bit of litmus testing. Actually, I'm being a bit hard on myself. I could do one or two other things as well. But anyway, we're going to do a little bit of litmus testing around uh, issues to begin with. And then what I want to do is explore engagement and citizenship uh, across communities of interest and affinity across, uh, within family support and beyond. Specifically, I want to give the example of how civic engagement can be used in child protection as a family support tool in a new, I think, innovative uh, uh, possibility or a way. Overall, the purpose of this paper and the purpose of this conference is part of engagement to try and move away from seeing families and children as troubled and feral, as they've been described by UK media in particularly lately, which I think is quite disturbing, <coughs> to one where we actually look to respect children and families and inevitably do what we're all paid to do in different ways around this room, help them find resolutions. So that's kind of part of the wider agenda. Um, so what we're doing is we're going to look at engagement uh, and participation with children and families, and the whole idea of civic engagement in a, in a very wide sense over the next two days. And that requires us just to move away from traditional views of working with children and families as service users or clients or people we work with and for, to actually think about new models of how we engage with and work with the people we work with and for. And also new ways of engaging with colleagues uh, in a different uh, radical way. So as you will see as the two days emerge, and as John, my colleague John Canavan at the end will bring to uh, some kind of conclusion and closure, we're opening up things something, something that's quite different. This is a different kind of conference than previous ones we've had. So we're kind of on a, a breach of, uh, of tradition. But our aim is to hopefully that we will actually inspire you, inspire you to think differently about what you do. And I think one thing we would all agree around the room is that we have to start thinking differently. So hopefully that will be something that will emerge over the next two days. And here's the litmus test. It's uh, nearly exactly uh, 20 years uh, since, to the month, nearly to the week, since the Kilkenny Incest Report was launched in, um, uh, I think it was, it was either Buswell's Hotel or the Gresham Hotel, I can't remember which, or the Shelburne, but one of those hotels, and I was there. And I remember um, uh, Brendan Howland, who was Minister for Health at the time, announcing that three million Punts, as it was then, would be invested in childcare to radically reform the whole system forever. One payment of three million. And a certain TD said to me, growling, I'll actually say it was Willie O'Dea, I wasn't going to say who it was, growling going out the back of the door, it's up to ye now, we've done our bit. Well, 20 years on, have we done our bit? And I say this with respect to Liz and Paul Harrison and various people here uh, who I know and other colleagues uh, um, uh, around the room. But, uh, and we'll be speaking with Nora tomorrow, but I think there are major challenges for the new agency. And putting it bluntly, having been involved on the design team uh, for the new agency, the whole idea of the new agency is that it was everybody under the tent or nobody under the tent. So I have a strong concern uh, that uh, we could end up with certain people, and I, you know, I'm including psychologists, I've been very honest and open about this, but it's very important to me that child and adolescent mental health are part of the community. It's very important to me that public health nursing 
And it's very important that psychologists are part of the community and the agency. Because inevitably, if that wasn't the case, we would end up where we always have been. And what was the main recommendation of Justice Catherine McGuinness in the Kilkenny incest case? Was better multidisciplinary interagency working together. 20 years ago, that, re that recommendation is still there. The other harsh reality is, and I think this was brought home to us a little bit with the, the crash scandal, is that people who work face to face, front line, day in, day out, with children and young people are least valued in the system. And that will be one of the points, I think, around engagement that we may need to think about radical change. The final kind of reality, which is a very, very real reality, is that there is a new food poverty in Ireland that's not been talked about. There is a hidden poverty in that, that has emerged, particularly over the last five or six years. Um, my sister runs the Capuchin Daycare Centre in Dublin. She's been doing it for 30 years. And they give food parcels out every day. They were given 150 food parcels two years ago. A food parcel, by the way, is a tin of beans, a packet of tea bags, a bag of sugar, toilet roll. It's as basic as that. They're now giving in the region of over 1,000 a day. And they're talking about people who are coming to the door who are privately saying, I'm a quantity surveyor. I have no money. So there is a new real poverty in Ireland that is a huge challenge to everybody in this room. You'd be glad to know that's the end of my negative rant. I'm going to get on to the positive rant. So we've got to be really careful. I think we all probably up to last week assumed things about early year services that we now know we shouldn't have assumed. And whereas you, by the way, is for universal and T is for targeted, whereas a lot of attention has been placed rightfully on the success or otherwise of targeted services, which is a key issue for the new agency. I feel there's a very important lost grouping in the middle that we need to think about. And what I mean by the lost grouping is, as Joe Robbins described it, lost children. Joe Robbins is a former, I think Liz Canavan, was he formerly in the same job as you, basically-ish, kind of, in the Department of Children many years ago. Um, but he wrote a great book called Lost Children, great book. And uh, I think that there if we do not pay attention to that bubble in the middle, we're running a serious problem of being polarised in how we work. Because inevitably, all that will happen is more and more from that bubble will stray towards T, and less and less will stray towards U. So I think there is a really strong question about targeting and engagement, about the engagement at the level of who we work with. So what do we mean by the context of engagement? Well, traditionally, we probably saw it as the second one, about working for young people and families. And by young people, I include children and adolescents equally. But in fact, we're talking about with young people and families in partnership of shared interest, as Charlie Bruner describes it. By partnerships of shared interest, his argument is the vast majority of children and families want the same things as the people who work with them. It's very few who don't want anything different. And actually thinking about civic engagement as a shared a shared task is, is a, a, a really important aspect. There is also the aspect of working for young people and families. And this is an interest in enabling outcomes. But also, I think we need to start thinking about coping. I think we have to value coping as equal to outcomes. We shouldn't only be focusing on better outcomes for children and families. Because let's be honest, there are many children and families out there for whom coping is their major concern. And when I mean coping, I'm talking about next Friday. I'm talking about a communion. I'm talking about whatever event that is going on for them. And then, more importantly, in some ways, from the argument we're going to produce over the next few days, is working on behalf of young people and families. So advocacy on the basis that family support is a right, that children and young people have a right to be supported, and that that coexists with other measures. So thinking of engagement and family support as a model for civic engagement is different and new. So what do we mean by that? Well, there are four forms of civic engagement. There's political, social, economic, and moral. So by political, we mean that fair attention is given to prevention, early intervention. Fair attention is given to the tangible support needs, the food banks, the things that people actually need in their lives. Social is to move away from just basic interventions that fix problems. It's to move to new forms of civic engagement, which enable people actually, through action, not to need services. 
Given the state the country is in, and for good reason anyway, for good, honest reasons, it also is about developing cost-effective economic interventions in working your own people. And if we look at the way money is spent, we have to be honest, it's not spent cost-effectively. And finally, a new idea is one of moral, or a right-based approach, not in a way that contests uh, politicians, but a right, and it may do that, but a, a right in the basis of something that is an entitlement that has shared responsibility. Colleagues Aileen Shaw and others have developed this uh, model in working papers within the centre. Julie Moon said in 2006 in a very good book on reflective practice, we don't reflect on simple things, we only, only on things that we can't do actually with no immediate solution. We forget about the obvious things. And uh, I think this is, it's a really good quote. So I'm going to talk about some very obvious things. So how do we value young carers who are completing civic family life by caring for their parents in their own home, who never appear in a service, who never appear at a case conference? How do we value what has been done innately within families? Daniel Kennan and uh, Dr. Alan Fives in our centre have done a really good study on the needs of young carers, which are so basic to enable them to continue to care for their parents. It's a really good example of civic action, which if young, those young people were doing in a voluntary organisation, they'd be getting a, president, a, a prize from our president. But they're not, it's not even known that they do it within their family home. What about volunteerism and empathy? Human empathy and volunteerism within many communities has potential that needs to be tapped further in terms of goodwill from people. Even if you take the real value of a week-in, week-out youth club. Um, my son Owen works with Veroliga, and a volunteer who works with him talked to me of a young girl lately saying that the only thing she had in her life that really was important to her in terms of existing and surviving was the regular week-in, week-out programme, which costs very little. Compared to that to programmes, which Andy Dawes in... Uh, at a conference in South Africa last year, said some programmes are not scalable, implementable or affordable. So there's serious questions about engagement about what we do. And then I think there's huge potential in civic engagement as a tool in family support for child protection. David Hawkins' programme, Communities That Care, is a very good example of where community action can be used in a non-vigilante way to actually support and protect local children who are vulnerable in the community. And the programme uses very practical, implementable action where people use their two eyes as citizens and their two ears and their mouth to help in a positive way protect children. And what's really important is that you don't see child abuse as harm and hidden. The model actually talks about treating the witnessing of physical, emotional abuse or willful neglect the same way you would treat that if you saw a child who has been injured in a traffic accident. If anybody in this room saw a kid at risk in a traffic accident, you do something about it. The same kind of model of community civic action, where community support and protect, has huge potential. A very good example of this actually can be taken from work that we've done in Zambia as part of our UNESCO programme. Dr Sheila McCardle and Dr Sue Redmond, but Sheila McCardle in the first instance who's here, worked in Zambia and looked at girls' understanding and families and parents' understanding of resilience. But a great model is where girls who are at physical risk in rural Zambia use, uh, utilise peers, uh, parents and neighbours to enable their own protection because they have to. And it's done in a way that is completely socially acceptable in that context. So Redmond's work looking at youth leadership is a very good example of how models of citizenship and youth leadership can be used in ways that can protect young people. But in order to develop those kind of models, it requires a new kind of partnership between services and communities. And heretofore, that hasn't been tried and tested in a full way. So, I don't know if anybody in the room is into drinking herbal teas, but my daughter, Roshin, is insisting that I start drinking more herbal tea. So she inevitably tries all these, gets these different flavours. I put it in the tea bag, I drink it, and I say it's revolting. Give me back my lion's tea. And then she says, Dad, you didn't infuse it. So I mixed up infusion with confusion. 
So she's quite right, of course, if you infuse tea, it, well, it's actually no better, but anyway, don't tell <laughs> But here's the thing, if we were to actually think seriously about civic engagement, if we were really to think seriously about getting away from a them and us approach to working with children, families and communities, and try and open our minds and infuse it, there is a strong argument, I think, in the literature and the evidence that you actually can enable people to be resilient. And the reason you can do that is by getting people to focus away from their <coughs> own problems and enable them to be civic actors in a positive way, they have value and it gives them respite from their own problems. And maybe it enables them to think differently about overcoming their own problems. I think the example of family group conferencing has huge potential and it's an excellent program that we haven't fully exploited in this regard. And I would say this very strongly. One of our second year students, Paul Byrne, has done a very good thesis on uh, the, the view of social workers on family group conference. It's an incredible example of how you bring people together for civic engagement. And I think it's huge potential that is untapped. I also think that at a very basic level, engagement with people through civic society in a way that people feel valued and respected and have a role and function can actually enable well-being in a new and different way. Much to the annoyance of people who research well-being, with due respect to the UNICEF indicators on well-being, there are many people who score completely high on all the aspects and the indicators on well-being, but their well-being is brutal. And there are many people who score very poorly on the indicators of well-being, and they have very good well-being. So why is that? Well, the answer is actually about successful relationships. And I would argue what civic engagement and engagement and participation can do is enable people to experience it winning successful relationships, which should not be undervalued. As Anne Sanson described it, a way of enabling a benevolent, benevolent society. So finally, here's what this would look like in real terms. We're talking about our engagement and participation through family support, and actually giving support, family support the rightful place it needs to have, I think. You're talking about young people at the level of young people, families, and local communities. Politicians, senior managers, service planners, and probably academics should be in there as well. Frontline staff, uh, and I actually think we have to start thinking about a new type of workforce for working with people. Not, and I think that, that is something that we may elaborate on over the next few days. But I think that is something that we certainly need to think about differently. And the interagency collaboration is an old chestnut at this stage. You know, it's the one thing in every report and every inquiry that is top of the list and repeated, that and other things. But in a way, I think there is an opportunity to actually think about community engagement with people you work with in a different way as well. So I hope I've uh, grown some thoughts into your head. And um, it's better to uh, have tried than to have failed. And uh, I don't know if people know this, but this is actually true. <laughs> Albert Einstein said he could never get a barber who could cut his hair properly. And they inevitably said, they apologised to him inevitably because they couldn't cut his hair. And he inevitably said to each and every one of them, probably as he paid them, a person who's never made a mistake means that they're doing nothing. Thank you.